Since we are in a dialogue of civilizations, I will use civilizations as my point of departure. And I think the very important thing is to try to focus on the positive points of civilizations. There are negative points, and I will mention some of them. If we start with the Western civilization, its enormous innovative capacity, its diversity, its enormous dynamism, its equally enormous negative aspect, the idea that it is the only real world civilization, and the world needs nothing more. All the others are traditionals. In other words, exclusivity at the cost of everybody else. And this is particularly pronounced, of course, in the epitome of Western civilization, US civilization. So when Professor Dalmeier asks about major root, major causes of the present disorder, it's the striving, traditionally, of the whole West for world hegemony, now, to a large extent, the U.S. only, the country in which you are a professor, Professor Dalmeier. Not accusing you of anything. But <clears throat> there has been a tradition to justify it. And the justification has, to a large extent, comes from theological sources. We are thinking, of course, of St. Augustine and St. Aquinas. But we are also thinking of the steps forward toward trying to find peaceful ways out. If I now should go a little bit more into detail, I would say that the strong side of Judaism is dialogue. The strong aspect of Orthodox Christianity is long-term optimism. Vox Gracie, Christ is a reason. The strong side of Catholic Christianity is the pardon, the forgiveness of the sinner, or the peccatore, if he makes a distance to his sin. The strong side of Protestantism, its diversity, its individualism. You combine all of this, and you would get a rather strong Christianity, but they don't like to combine themselves. The strong side of Islam seems to me to be deep togetherness and sharing. And if we now move further east, the strong side of Hinduism is its polytheism, its cult of the birth, of the preservation, but also destruction. The strong side of Buddhism being its network, its relationism, that we exist in our relations to each other. The strong side of Confucianism, its feudality, its feudalism, but with rights both at the top and at the bottom, and duties both at the top and at the bottom. I would like to put very much emphasis on Taoism. It's enormous strength in emphasizing holism and dialectics. As opposed to Cartesianism, Cartesianism advises us when we shall study a problem to divide it into small parts and take one at a time. Taoism says exactly the opposite, looks for the whole, the holon, of which it is a part. You move further east, you come to Japan, it's eclecticism, it's eclectic ability. And I like to make a little stop in Hawaii, on the trip around the world, with the aloha culture, the aloha as the divine nature that is spiriting everything. Now, what I get from all of this is that we have enormous resources to draw upon. And the question then is, what is the formula? Well, I have, as a matter of fact, a little formula. It's in a book called The Theory of Peace. 
And the formula is a fraction, it's in the front page, with a numerator and a denominator, and it points to four factors. It's a result of 65 years of work in the field, and uh, I can give it in 65 seconds, which shows you some of the injustice of the world. Now, point one, equity. That was pointed out in the brilliant speech about economics. Equity means cooperation for mutual and equal benefit. It's the and equal which is the tricky part. Point two is empathy. Understand others as they understand themselves. That doesn't mean you accept it. Because if you're heading for equity, you're not accepting anybody's exclusive title to be the world civilization. But you have to know about it. If you now have an empathy that leads to harmony, and you have a cooperation that leads to equity, we are in not bad shape. But in the denominator, there are two dangers lurking. And the two dangers are unreconciled trauma and unresolved conflict. Reconciling trauma and solving conflict. If you are able to do that, you are in very good shape. Now, this is based on, let us say, quite a lot of years of work, about 150 mediations. And if I now should go into some of the tricky problems we are talking about, I will start with Ukraine. If you have one state with two nations, and you have one president, you have a recipe for perennial failure. The former presidents didn't last long, nor will the present one. The way out is, of course, a federation. The question is how you constitute that federation between the unit, Catholic with Orthodox ritual, a rather brilliant formula in itself, talking Ukrainian, and the Russian Orthodox, talking Russian, is crucial. When I'm mediating, and I prefer now to do it on Skype, not only because I prefer not to travel as enormously amount as I have been doing in the past, but also because there are bullets whistling, and uh, not that I haven't heard that song of bullets close to my ear during my life, but it's not a very nice song. So, if I do it on Skype, I suggest a smart federation in the sense that the gas and oil that will flow to the Russian part could also flow further west. And the free trade that would flow to the Union, Ukrainian part, could also flow to the east. In other words, you take the two strong points deriving from the two strong neighbors and you make deals. The reaction I get from Kiev when I propose this is that we don't have that smart politicians. If we had, it might be possible. So, my answer is, of course, you have to create them. And maybe they are not known today. Whenever you have a vision, be prepared for the fact that it takes some time. In 1976, I had a vision of the decline and fall of the U.S. empire. It was repeated again in year 2000. My model for the decline and fall was the decline and fall of the Roman empire. And it was a rather gratifying historical job to point to similarities with relatively few dissimilarities. It's going in that direction. It's going in the direction that the U.S. hegemony, as they call it, now has to be exercised militarily, mainly by themselves killing. 
because nobody else, or very few, with the exception of my little country, Norway, is willing to kill for them. Now that's the fall of an empire. Why doesn't China fall? Because it's not based on an empire, it's based on dynasties. The strong part of the Chinese civilization, it's a dynastic rather than imperial constellation. The transition from one to the other is often horrible, but it is limited in space and also limited in time. Whereas what happens in other parts of the world, particularly in the West, is the birth, expansion, maturity, decline and fall of empires and tremendous amount of animosity among nations and states. Now, here you have already some strengths and weaknesses. And I pointed to the formula for Ukraine, which is very similar to Putin's formula. I've only added one point that, from my point of view, is essential. The smartness in cooperation. Neutrality would inevitably be a part of it. I have no problem with what happened in 19 if you will, it in 2014 about Crimea. It is somewhat related to what happened in 1954. Khrushchev giving a gift to Ukraine, his wife being Ukrainian, he himself being born in Ukraine. The gift probably being motivated the same way as Stalin's policy relative to Georgia with South Ossetia and Abkhazia, namely to tie others to Moscow through generosity. I have no problem with the idea that in 2014 the conditions for that no longer obtained, but I think that Russia should have granted the Tatars an autonomy in Crimea that could have worked as a precedent for the Russian used precedent, Kosovo, Kosovo, where they failed to give autonomy to the Serbs. But having said that, I am critical of the Russian approach to Syria. It's to me too much reminiscent of Afghanistan. And I think it will mobilize in the Islamic civilization the same hatred as the Soviet war in Afghanistan mobilized. The geopolitics of it has been pointed out by very many and can be seen. But I think a much wiser approach to the Islamic State would be the following two points. Point one, defensive use of military. Kill one Islamic soldier and you get ten in return. And you get them quickly. The German spy organization says this is too low, it's closer to 30. You get them quickly. But you can use the military defensively, parachuting down a circle of defense around threatened minorities and threatened places. There are many of them. At the same time, I think one has to understand that there is a weak point in Islam, the point legitimizing retribution. And Islam has had an enormous amount in that region to be retributive about. Just imagine for your own imagination, somebody destroying the Vatican by methods similar to Sykes-Picot in 1915. Those same somebody then bombing one Catholic country after the other. Imagine the forces you would get, oh hatred, of revenge, of dreams of reconstituting. Well, exactly this happened in the Middle East. Exactly this happened. So don't be surprised if there are strong forces. But the retribution takes a very brutal form, which has been very much described. Although I do not belong to those who think that it is worse to decapitate 100 persons than to kill 100,000 
by bombs, drones, and shooting. I do not belong to those. I belong to those who are against both of them, being firmly convinced that conflicts can be solved. So what is the solution in the longer run? Be aware that people who have a dream are strong. And the Islam mixed state people have a dream. The reconstitution of the caliphate lost in 1924, with a Sykes-Picot background. This reconstitution has today made 92% of Saudi Arabia's inhabitants, according to a recent public opinion study, declaring that the Islamic State is the carrier of the true Islam, it being understood Saudi Arabia is not. But Saudi Arabia is the custodian of the two mosques, evidently a very bad custodian. That's where the battle is. The battle is not in Iraq and Syria. That's not the basic one. The battle is for the south. Look up your map of where the Ottoman Empire was, the Caliphate, that was the religious aspect of it, and you'll get an image of what's at stake. In 1924, if that's what they want to reconstitute, there was no Israel. Israel, again, is at the root of it. How do we solve that one? Patient negotiation, not bombing. Patient negotiation, telling Israel in no uncertain terms that if Israel does not stand for a modest Israel, compatible with the 2002 Riyadh Declaration of the Arab League, by and large 1967 borders, incidentally signed by Abraham Medijad from Iran. In other words, it has a very strong backing from the Muslim side. If Israel does not agree to that, they will be in for exactly the same as happened to South Africa, namely United States saying, we are, you have become a liability. I think the US is quite close to that, actually, and getting closer and closer. For which reason, I would not be surprised if before 2020, we have a reasonable solution to Israel-Palestine. When it comes to Syria, I am not quite sure that the vilayat that were put together, the provinces of the empire, the Ottoman Empire, that were put together and called Syria, that they really constitute a country, even if they have that name. I'm not quite sure about that. Maybe a federation, maybe a confederation, with other aspects of the Ottoman Empire, other vilayat. In other words, that it moves in the direction of reconstituting in the area something Ottoman Empire Caliphate. And that maybe the Islamic State have understood more of history than the West, including the Russian part of the West. Whether Russia withdrew from Afghanistan, I sense that Russia is already now complaining about human shields and about arms being close to mosques. Sounds very much like the United States. And I'm not quite sure that this is a viable way to proceed. I would like to say some words about the immigration refugee crisis. <clears throat> I think it is a basic mistake to refer to them as asylum seekers, migrants, refugees. I think we are dealing with what in German is called the Völkerwanderung. It's a whole population on the move major parts of Africa, major parts of the Middle East, major parts of North Africa, WANA, West Asia, North Africa, certainly in it. In this particular constellation, according to the mediation that I've been engaged in, there are three basic reasons 
and they are all very well known, but they come together in the same person quite often. Point one, the devastation of the region by warfare, much of it instigated by the West and by the US in particular. By terrible capitalism, depriving them of resources, and much worse after colonialism than before. Before they were amateurs. After colonialism, they have become professionals in doing it. There is bribing, there is corruption, there is cooperation from corrupt African elites and so on in it. But all of that does not serve as any kind of excuse of what's happening. Colonialism itself, slavery. With that kind of background, is anybody surprised if you had the equipment for it and you could see the number of people moving from most parts of Africa northwards? You would be shocked. We are talking about millions. It will last, as far as I can understand, decades, maybe 50 years. And that brings us to the second motivation. France and England, and to some extent Italy, presented themselves as mother countries. There are many people who are moving to mother for motherly love. France and England being the major centers where the mothers are supposed to live in Paris and London on full-time duty. Well, is this sarcastic? No, it is not sarcastic. They mean it. But there is, of course, a third interpretation, which is you settled and you were not invited with us. You behaved atrociously. We will settle with you. We are not invited. But we'll respect your rules. We'll behave considerably better than you. What's the solution? There is only one solution. <clears throat> and that is Africa's own development as was mentioned in the excellent development section we had. I think the best model, if you want somebody's model, is what Japan did from 1868 onwards in East Asia. And it has been followed and today is imitated by China. Chinese development is essentially the Japanese pattern. The basic economist being Kanema Akamatsu, not the famous David Ricardo, or any other for that man, Western economist. This deserves all kinds of attention, but it has to be Africa's own job. There is nothing wrong in having a model. The model will have to be adjusted and have to be changed, but will be a source of inspiration, and the West is not that source. Thank you so much, Mr. Chairperson. Hi. Follow your advice and hear them out. Thank you. <laughs>